Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Well, good morning, <clears throat> VXV Church. Good to see you here. Let's open our Bibles to the 10th chapter <clears throat> of the book of Hebrews. We made it down to uh, verse 32 uh, the last time we were together, and that's where we'll pick it up this morning. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32. And now this week, we're going to swing the pendulum in the other direction here. And uh, probably for most of us, a most welcome uh, direction. You remember last week, <clears throat> we tackled two of the most difficult verses in all of the New Testament. And now what we're going to discover here is just a great pastoral sensitivity uh, on the part of the writer of Hebrews whom again I happen to believe uh, is the Apostle Paul. Now, you know what it's like that no good parent ever really enjoys disciplining their children. It's just not something that we like to do. Uh, but we know it's something that we have to do if we're going to shepherd our children's hearts well. And I believe that the Lord in his brilliance designed these kids to be so darn cute in the disciplining, that it has the effect of bringing us around to how we are to follow up that discipline, and that is with love and reinforcement and encouragement. When my four-year-old son, Henry, uh, endures discipline, there is nothing cuter on this planet than that quivering, suddenly rectangular little lower lip, right? And in fact, it's so darn adorable that I find it quite difficult not to laugh at him, uh, which of course infuriates him all the more. Why are you laughing at me, man? I can't help it. I am telling you, even mad, that kid is cuter than a baby dreaming about puppies wearing sweaters. I mean, the only thing that makes discipline endurable as a parent is that, that I get to scoop up that hot-tiered little person in my arms and just hold him close and love on him and encourage him. And, and so it is for the parent that there can be that special sweetness in discipline that when done well, we get to enjoy and cherish. What a good person does after discipline is just as important as the discipline itself. And this our Heavenly Father knows all too well. Now, as we read these last eight verses in chapter 10, this, this is precisely the, the flavor and the tenor uh, that we're going to discover going on here. The writer of Hebrews has just delivered one of the most chastening warnings in all of the scripture, concluding with those chilling words, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In all of the New Testament epistles, you will not find a harder hitting, more aggressive passage than the one we studied last week. And now right on the heels of that, we're going to find consolation and comfort and reassurance. God is going to pick us back up and encourage us with his promises and his rewards. Now, we understand that God is holy. 
We understand that God is just, but we also understand that God is love. And we labored last week to ensure in our understanding that the justice of God and the love of God, that they are both inseparably linked to the perfections of his nature. A proper understanding of the justice of God knows that that any indifference to moral evil would be imperfect. God is perfect. Therefore, God cannot be indifferent to moral evil. Now, you and I, we are indifferent to certain moral um, evils because we are imperfect. But any indifference to moral evil, even the slightest indifference to moral evil on the part of God would right then and there make him less than infinitely and perfectly glorious and therefore he would cease to be God altogether. This is what we tried to grab last week. To reject the wrath of God is really to to reject the idea of God altogether because he is holy. Now, therefore, the reason the writer of Hebrews went all full metal jacket last week was because he was dealing with those in the assembly that he felt were in danger of apostasy. If a person has presented unto them the full knowledge of the gospel over and over and over again, and yet they don't respond, it's BBs off a battleship, right? Well, then the writer was saying, look, there is a line in the sand somewhere where the human heart can become so hardened that the possibility of salvation is gone. It is past. There is no coming back ever. And of course, the only thing that is left for such an individual is the fiery indignation of God's wrath. Now, now here's where I think that, that some of us might learn some things today concerning how God chooses to deal with his people. There are a number of ways that God has chosen to motivate his image bearers. And the Lord has no reservations whatsoever in motivating human beings with fear where there is ignorance. Where a human being is in a state of ignorance concerning the love and the mercy and the grace of God, that the Lord will motivate the ignorant which, uh, with fear, which is in itself for such people, an act of love. But now listen to me. By far, what God would prefer that his children respond to is his love and his mercy and his grace. God would far prefer to motivate human beings with his kindness than he would with his wrath. Now the Bible says over and over, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And indeed, that's true. It is the beginning of of wisdom. It's not the middle. It's not the end. It's the beginning. Now, of course, we always ought to maintain a healthy reverence for the holiness of God. But the emphasis upon all of these texts, it's the beginning of wisdom. And indeed, it is. A human being ignorant of their own depravity before a thrice holy God. They must come to see their spiritual bankruptcy and sin. They must come to see their absolute need for the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ in order to be saved. Now from there, from that point, again, it is God's preference that you would be motivated by his love and his kindness because there's no longer anything to fear by way of judgment for those in Christ. Here's the apostle Paul in Romans 2. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Do do you guys not know this? He's saying not knowing that what? The kindness of God leads you to repentance. Brothers and sisters in Christ, man, man, listen. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. The the prince of preachers, the, the great Charles Spurgeon helps us here. He said this. 
When I thought God was hard, I found it easy to sin. But when I found God so kind, so good, so overflowing with compassion, I smote upon my breast to think that I could ever have rebelled against the one who loved me so and sought my good. You see, this is how, this is how it's supposed to work. This is the way it works. This is the way that the Christian soul is transformed when it delights in the kindness and the goodness of God over and above all those inferior affections that compete for our heart's attention. It is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Now then, will God motivate his children with fear? Well, sure, when perfect knowledge and intimate love demands it. Will God motivate his children with discipline? Sure, when perfect knowledge and infinite love demands it. And we'll see that in chapter 12. But far in a way, because again, no good parent prefers discipline, do they? They clearly prefer obedience. Far in a way, it is your God's preference that you order your life and that you respond to his word, not out of fear or discipline, but out of your sheer delight in his extraordinary kindness and love to you. And that is the direction to which we're now turning, picking it up here in verse 32. Now, he began all of this, this entire section on application. He began all of this by exhorting the church to draw near, to hold fast, to spur one, or one another on to a deeper expression of love and good works. He then turned and gave them a very stern warning to those in danger of apostasy because that's what perfect love and wisdom demanded. And now he turns back once again to the faithful souls in this assembly and he now encourages them. And indeed, he encourages you and I today. This is how, what we're about to read, this is how you draw near and hold fast and get behind each other in this walk in the midst of the very difficult days. Uh, in which we live. Now, for those of you type A folks in the room, uh, here's your outline for the text uh, we have before us this morning. Uh, the writer is going to motivate and encourage us by way of three constructs, all right? Reminder, reward, and response. If we're going to stir one another up to, to a deeper expression of, of love and good works, we need to remember where we were. We need to look back at what's already been done. Then we need to look ahead and, and appropriate a kind of present enjoyment today of those rewards that we know are marching in our direction. So we have to look forward Looking back, looking forward, and what the writer will then demand of us for our own delight is the proper response given where we have been and given where we are, are most assuredly going as sons and daughters of the living God. And so it is reminder, reward, and response now in a, a tremendously practical study here in the Word of God this morning. What we are going to school today. We get after it again now, and we go to work here in verse 12. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 32, here we go. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, after coming to Christ, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle, very interesting word there, through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners, and, and underline this and circle this right here, and accepted joyfully. The seizure of your property. How, now, how did they do that? How did they do that? Notice, knowing that you have for yourself a better possession and a lasting one. And so here these guys are, and, and they, they, they are just worn out. 
right? They've got friends and family members harassing them to come back to the temple and and come back to the animal sacrificial system. They're they're no doubt very close to the front end of of all this persecution that's going to come at the hands of that lunatic emperor Nero. Uh, They've got a handful of brothers in the assembly that are still on the fence in their commitment to Christ. Uh, These guys are struggling. They are just worn out. And I am always amazed at the timing of God and the sovereignty of God and having us in this text in our day. Because although what you and I are enduring nationally isn't as difficult as what our first century brothers were enduring here, shockingly, it's not that far off. Look, it it has been a most unusual year for us here in 2020. I don't care what side of the fence you're on. We, We can all agree upon that. Our nation is trafficking in an extraordinary amount of deception that the likes of which I've never seen in my lifetime. But, but that's what the enemy does. He traffics in deception and he traffics in fear and most of us are buying it. As a culture, we have become wildly intolerant uh, where we differ from one another. Cancel culture has just crushed the freedom of expression. And never have we been a people so divided. In the coup de grace, of course, uh, we've got what would be very difficult not to call uh, state-sponsored violence in so many of our cities. And, and man, let's face it, we are just worn out out. Are we not? And now here comes the Lord through the writer of Hebrews and the sacred inspired scriptures. And he is saying to you and I now, look, I want you to remember. I want you to remember where you were, who you are, and therefore what you can endure and what I'm doing in it. Now, the first thing that strikes you here in this passage is that the writer of Hebrews is not taking these boys back to the good old days, right? That is not the sentiment at all here. What he is taking them back to are the difficult days of their parents' faith and and their faith. Notice what he's saying here. After being enlightened, in other words, after coming to, to the saving knowledge of Christ, you guys did what? You partied like it was 1999, or I guess in their case, 99. I don't know. Uh, but, but is that what we've got going on here? I mean, are these good times that he's asking them to recall here? No. What are they remembering? Notice their great conflict of sufferings, reproaches and tribulations, seizure of property. Now, why in the world would the apostle want them to remember this? Because it's not the good old days that advance us in the faith, is it? It's not the times when things go well that that, that define our Christian lives. In this Christian pilgrimage, the times that you and I remember are the times of difficulty when God showed up and and proved himself to our faith. It is precisely when we are weak that God shows himself to be most strong. That's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Now, allow me to go totally in the other direction here that we might see this because, man, man, if you can grab this, if you can get this brother or sister, you will be on your way in a very good way in this journey. So let me run it all the way to the other wall, all right? Suppose this present life, suppose this present life was filled with just one cakewalk after another. Rainbows and butterflies and skillets and seahorses and puppy dogs and pudding and pixie sticks. 
I don't know why seahorses would be in there, but, 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 but suppose these lives of ours were utterly free from sorrow and suffering and separation, never a trial or trouble at all. What do you suppose would be the effect of that? Well, we would become content with our present portion, wouldn't we? We would have no longing for our true home. We would have no desire, as Paul said, to depart and be with Christ. We would become so satisfied with what is inferior and temporary that our lives would be driven to the center of self, utterly satisfied with the shadows and ignorant of the things to which they point. Now, Look at how we sell Jesus in the American church in our day. Hey, come to Jesus and he's going to fix your marriage. Come to Jesus and he's going to fix your checking account. Come to Jesus and he is going to heal your body of every ill. Come to Jesus. The kids will make parole. Put whatever you want to put in there. Uh, right. That's not how it works. The abundant life that Jesus came to promise us, that abundance, is not found in the inferior and temporary. Abundance can never be found in the inferior and temporary, but that's how we sell it. That is biblically insane, soul-crushing heresy, and it only hurts people in the end because when it doesn't happen, they're going to take their ball and go home. They're going to abandon the faith. The abundant Christian life cannot be found in the shadows. It can only be found in fellowship with the light of the world from which the shadows are cast. And that's what he wants these guys to remember. Because that's what their parents had done. That's what they had once done. Mark very carefully what he says there. Yes, there are conflicts and reproaches and tribulations. But notice there, they joyfully accepted them. Why? Because they knew that they had a better possession and a lasting possession. You might have better and abiding in your translation. You might have better and enduring. But, but I want you to notice the two pieces to this, guys. There are two pieces to this. This is huge. You got to get this. Better. Two pieces about this possession. Better, superior, and lasting, eternal. Better in quality, lasting in duration. In other words, the writer wants these guys to remember, there was a day when you rejoiced, not in the inferior in quality and the temporary in duration, but in the superior and eternal. Now, just to be sure, what is this better and eternal possession of theirs and ours that we are to remember. Well, what is it? Well, it's, it's the good news that we've been studying for the better part of the year here, right? That Jesus has triumphed over death, that we share in all that is his, that there is a final glorious rest for, uh, to come for all of us. And, and that rest is secure. He is the Anchor of our soul. And that anchor is planted in the throne room of God. And, and you remember, we are just being winched in so we can draw near to God because he has removed and forgotten our sin. Guilt is gone. He has perfected our consciences before God. Our enemies have been subdued. And now we can hold fast and draw near and encourage one another with these things. And we can do that he says in our text here today, by remembering our better and lasting possessions. So what we're saying, what we're saying is this, this better and lasting possession of ours, it is not a thing. It is a person who gave us such a great salvation. It is Jesus Christ. And so now we have acceptance with God and fellowship with God and enjoyment of God forever. And church, I believe this is the main task of preaching, that we would see and savor the glory of God 
in this better and abiding possession of ours. That what we have in Christ is infinitely better in quality and infinitely enduring in nature. His person and this great salvation of ours is wildly superior to all of the inferior and temporary things that this world has to offer. Now the writer wants these guys to remember when this was true for them. And he wants you and I to remember this is true for us. And now here's the rub, brothers and sisters, and pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. Here's the rub. Until this is perfectly true for you and I, until we are oriented around the better and the enduring rather than the inferior and temporary until that is perfectly true for you and I, God is going to be performing his good work of separation in our lives. And this work will go on until you are perfected, made perfect in the day of Christ Jesus. Paul tells us this, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will what? Perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And that, that's the strongest Greek word we have in all of the New Testament to express the word confidence there, all right? Make no mistake about it. The word of God is telling you this will happen. That is a promise right there. You will be perfected. And so, so here were you and I, We were at enmity with God, the Bible says, right? We were the enemies of the cross, Romans 8, 7, James 4, 4. And then the Spirit of God came, convicted us of sin, bore witness to the gospel in our hearts, and drove us into the arms of Jesus. We now possess salvation. We have been saved. And now being saved... God begins his lifelong process of separating you and I from the inferior and temporary. He is perfecting us. And that work of separation, it comes by conflict, it comes by reproaches, and it comes by tribulation. And so much of the work of God in our lives, brothers and sisters, man, you need to see this. Much of the work of God in our lives is God bringing forth this constant work of separation degree by degree, glory by glory, making us more unlike, more like, more like unto the image of his son. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. And now the extraordinary thing that this and so many other texts in the word of God tell us is that the greater and greater you are oriented around the better and the lasting. In other words, the more and more you see heaven as your home, the more and more you are able to deal with and even enjoy these instruments of separation that are bringing you there. Now, shocking as this may sound to our ears, this was the hallmark of the early church, right? That he wants these guys to remember here. They they were rejoicing because at one point they understood what all of this was producing. What was it producing? These momentary light, it's momentary and it's light and it's it's doing something your pain it's it's doing something it's it's momentary and light compared to eternity it's not momentary and light right now but compared to eternity it's momentary and light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison your pain does something eternally While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are what? There it is again, temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Are you beginning to pick up on this? You remember Acts chapter 5. 
There you had Peter and John shortly after the resurrection. They're, they're preaching the gospel in Jerusalem as men just possessed of this kind of joy. Well, the religious leaders, of course, they get all torqued off, haul the boys off before the Sanhedrin. Uh, in court. They want to kill them right there. Of course, Gamaliel steps in and uh, they end up just beating these guys with sticks. It's sort of downgraded to a, a catch and release operation there. And here is Dr. Luke's rather matter-of-fact recording of this incident. He says this. They took his advice, his, the council being they, his being Gamaliel. They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them. So they went on their way, Peter and John, from the presence of the council. After being beaten, what were they doing? Rejoicing! That they had been considered, how foreign is this to you and I? Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. There it is right there. They were rejoicing. Now, now again, this is unbelievable to us. But these boys had been with Jesus every day for three years. They understood. Listen now. They understood what you and I so often fail to recognize. First comes the cross. Then comes the crown. First comes the cross. Then comes the crown. You see, we've been sold the wrong bill of goods. We've been sold the wrong bill of goods. We, we want the crown without the cross. But that is not how the Christian journey works. The cross comes before the crown. What did Jesus tell us himself? If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. And, and this, not too long ago, do you remember what Jesus told the boys in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2? Do you remember that? You will be tested. You will have tribulation. But if you will be faithful to the end, I will give you what? The crown of life. The cross comes before the crown. Listen to me. If you buy the wrong bill of goods, if, if you buy what Happy Fun Church is selling you, you will have been ill-taught and ill-equipped to deal with and even rejoice in the very instruments through which God is bringing you to glory. And then rather than rejoicing, you're going to bail and you're going to whine and you're going to cry and you're likely to take your ball and go home. This is why we are doing nobody any favors when we tamper with the full counsel of God. If you will put yourself under the teaching of the full counsel of God's words. You remember Paul and the only uh, elder directed uh, counsel we have in the New Testament. Uh, Acts chapter 20, I believe, Paul said to the Ephesian elders, look, man, I, I will have no blood on my hands because I taught you what? The full counsel of God. If you will put yourself under the teaching of the full counsel of God's word, you will be equipped and emboldened and even encouraged as God is bringing you to overcome your attachment to the inferior and temporary, replacing it with something infinitely better, infinitely more valuable and satisfying than what you are being weaned from. Remember, something better and something eternal. Now, James helps us with this. And maybe if you've seen this a hundred times before, it makes a little more sense to you now. Consider it all joy, my brethren. You know the verse. When you encounter various trials, again, same word here, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. We need endurance. That is what you and I need, particularly in this difficult day. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. Let those words sit in your heart. Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, this is God's intent for your life. Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And if you are his child, 
That's where you're going to go. Now, is this easy? No, it is not. It is not. But this is the path before every one of us in this room. If I don't love you well, you'll be the poorer for it. You're going to get hit. You're going to hurt. You're going to scream. You're going to fall down. That's the cross. But you're going to get back up. You're going to stand. You're going to overcome. You're going to rejoice. You're going to be a little bit stronger each time around the dance floor. You're going to be more like Christ. That's the crown. That's the gospel. Because here's what's happening. And every seasoned Christian knows this. The more and more you are weaned from the dead, fruitless weight of the inferior and temporal, the more you're weaned from that, the more and more your, your life is filled with ever-increasing joy and wonder and delight in the infinite fountain that never runs dry. Never runs dry. You know the verse, John chapter 4. Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, like this water, what the earth offers you, temporary and inferior, put anything you want in the world in there, okay? Like wh wh whoever drinks of this water, you're going to thirst again. You're going to need a bigger boat or a faster car, right? You will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst better, eternal, better, lasting, better, and abiding, right? Will never thirst. The water that I will give him will become in him a well of eternal water springing up into eternal life. Now, so, so that's what's happening. God is performing a separating work in our lives, and it's going to go on until that day where we are perfected and we are going to be weaned from the inferior and temporary. In order, but, but God's not going to leave you there. He's going to replace that with a wild wonder and awe and marvel and delight that just puts that to shame. That's how we grow. Now, notice what else is happening when the Lord has you on this track. And this is wildly important because this is often a, a gospel entry point for others in, in that by design. Now, the writer uses a couple of very interesting words here. Um, this word for conflict, this is the word athlesis. Uh, it's where we get our word athletics from. It means to contest, to combat, to strive. It means to struggle. Nobody said this was easy. But then notice, you've got an audience. This Greek word for public spectacle, it is theatrizo, and this is where we get our word theater from. And it means to bring upon a stage. It, it means a, a gazing stock, which in the biblical times had the idea of people looking at you out of either contempt or curiosity, okay? You see, when you and I, when we are contesting and combating, the world is watching us wrestle, right? And we become a kind of theater before the lost, a gazing stock. We are like unto athletes upon a stage, and it is when we fight well, that those without hope are made curious about Christ. Listen to me. Man, man, it is not when things are all happy and clappy that you are an effective advertisement for the gospel. It's just not. It is when people see you in the place of the press and you are rocking it like nobody they've ever seen. That is what draws people to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, look at how that brother is handling this deal. I can't believe the spirit and the poison, the grace and the... Man, I got to find out what's going on with that guy, right? There are scores of people in the family of God today that were drawn there by attending the theater of suffering Christians. 
It's always been that way. It happened at the foot of the cross for the centurion in Matthew 27. It happened to the multitudes after Peter and John were whipped in Acts 5. It happened to Paul's jailer in Acts chapter 16. It is still happening today. The theater of your life can be a magnet for the gospel. And then there's our children. Oh, our precious children. Listen, because this is true whether you know it or not. Do you know what our kids remember from their childhood in the church? Do you know what impacts them the most for the gospel? It's not ping pong and papa shot and potlucks and plays. All right? It is when they see the strength of the power of Christ pouring through mom and dad in times of trouble. That's what they remember. When they see mom and dad walking the gospel out on the ground, in the trenches, they, they see God's power made perfect in your weakness, man. That's real. That's the good stuff. That's what they remember. And it is that which offers the powerful opportunity to change the course of their future. And so when we face trouble, we should endeavor to mine out treasures for the future. Which, of course, is precisely what the writer of Hebrews is doing here. He's saying, remember the former days. Remember when your parents rocked it. Remember when you rocked it. How do we draw near? How do we hold fast? How do we encourage one another? Well, first of all, the writer of Hebrews says, you remember. What are we to remember? You remember who you are and still are in Christ. You remember what you got. You remember how this works. You remember the joy of God working. You remember the world is watching. And so we are to remember. We are to look back. And now we're also to look forward. First it's reminder. Now it's reward. Picking it up in verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Wow. For you have need of endurance. Oh, oh yes. Yes, we do. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive, a little bit tricky there in the Greek, that this means you will receive in the Greek, and that's what you have if you got an NIV. You will receive what was promised. What was promised back at th verse 35. Great reward. And now he quotes Habakkuk 2 here. For yet in a very little while. Oh, oh, in the scope of eternity, what is left of this life is indeed a very little while. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay in a very little while. In the grand scope of eternity, which is what we have in view here, what is left for the rest of our lives, oh, it is indeed a very little while. When the authors of Scripture contemplate our eternal estate, they characterize our present estate in terms of astonishing brevity. James calls it a vapor. A mist, a puff of smoke. Paul calls it a twinkling of an eye. You see, what, the, what, what men of great faith have the capacity to understand is that when you stretch the fabric of eternity out, uh, literally and figuratively, the, uh, there is no end. But these lives of ours are but the tiniest microscopic sliver of a speck, utterly just swallowed up and shut up in the reality of eternity. That is the biblical perspective. That is the biblical reality revealed in the word of God that we would do invariably well to meditate on and pray through as we consider how it is that we ought to order our lives now. Now again, I'm not suggesting that makes it a cakewalk, but listen, a proper biblical perspective when prayed through and meditated upon can do wonders for our endurance. 
Indeed, this is what Paul calls for in Colossians 3 and verse 2. Set your mind on things above and beyond, not upon the things of this earth, which Jesus would add is here today and gone tomorrow. But my word, my revelation to you, it lasts what? Forever. Now, the writer doesn't think it's a cakewalk either, right? You have need of endurance. Now, you don't have need of endurance if life is a cakewalk. You have need of endurance because you're facing a steady headwind. But now here comes the motivation. This is the good stuff. The, the writer is telling us that fuel for your endurance, the fuel for your endurance, it is your future. All right, this is very clear here. Don't throw away your confidence because that confidence has a great reward. When you have done the will of God, you will receive, you will receive what is promised. The fuel for your endurance comes from the promised rewards for doing so. So, Look back to your salvation. Remember how this works. Remember the joy of coming to the Lord. Remember the world is watching. And now here, it is look forward to your future, which holds out for you the promise of extraordinary rewards. In other words, in both directions, friends, we have tremendous motivation to press on. Now, the subject of rewards for the believer is an expansive one in the New Testament and one that is outside of our present scope. Here it is the writer's lot to simply remind us briefly there are tremendous rewards to be had for faithfulness, a point he's going to wrap up in a minute. He wants us to look back, but he also wants us to look forward. What I will say this morning on the subject of the believer's reward, um, ever so briefly, so no child is left behind, is this. And let, let, let's try to frame this in all that we're learning today, okay? Because I want you to see the whole picture. The, the Lord will motivate the unbelieving and ignorant with fear and wrath because that is what perfect love and a commitment to his own glory demands. And then for his blood-bought, adopted children, those who have come to a saving knowledge of Christ, it is the Lord's chief desire that you and I would be motivated primarily by his kindness and his extraordinary love and mercy and grace. But being the perfect parent, being the perfect father, he will also make, motivate his children through discipline, and being the perfect father, he will also motivate his children through reward. Now, we must be very careful, as many Christians have not, not to demote the believer's reward as some kind of second-class motivation. Don't do that. Because his rewarding us for the things he enables us to do, that's part and parcel to his extraordinary kindness. Now, just think that through. The Lord is the one who gives you the grace and the strength and the power to do some good thing. Like, he gives you the grace and strength to do some good thing, and then he turns right around and rewards you for it. You understand that? Like, why such extraordinary kindness? Because it takes many of us half the journey to figure out that there's nothing good in us apart from him. That's John 15, 5. That's another Bible study. I want you to meditate on that. Like, God gives you the grace and strength to do something. You could not do it without that enabling, and then he turns around and rewards you for it. So kind. And so here's the good news on rewards that should serve as a, a, an extraordinary motivator for you and I to see the inferior and the temporary from the superior and eternal. Everything that you and I do on this tiny little speck of time we call now 
You know, the one that's swallowed up and shut up in eternity, right? Everything that you and I do upon this planet, right here and now on this side of the resurrection, postures the landscape of our eternal experience. Do we understand the magnitude of that? Now, going back, now, go back and get our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 if you want to chase this down. But our faithfulness upon this earth determines the quality of our eternal experience. Now, somebody always says to that, ah, I don't care about my rewards. I'm happy being a street sweeper in the new Jerusalem. Here's the problem with that. Most streets aren't dirty. There is nothing unclean in the New Jerusalem. But hey, if you are saved and you know that you are saved and you know where you are going, but you're not at all concerned about the quality of your eternity, well, might I suggest you quietly close your Bible and, and slip on out to your car. I'm kidding, don't do that. We'd all see your immaturity on full display because you have no idea what's coming your way. Look. Where we spend eternity, the where question. So, so there, there's two steps, right? Now, the where question is determined by one thing and one thing alone. What say ye of Christ? But then being a believer, what you must understand, being a believer, the Bible is utterly unblushing in its promise of rewards for faithfulness. What you do with what God has given you, that will determine the quality of your eternal experience. Everything that you do every day of every week, of every month, of every year is posturing and positioning and landscaping the quality of your eternal experience. It is a mind-bending reality to delight in or to get up and start landscaping. But that's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, right? Where neither moth or rust destroy, rust destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. That's what the parable of the talents is about in Matthew 25. That's what Paul, speaking of the, uh, the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, he, Paul says, we, yes, we, we will differ from one another in glory. To one, the glory of the sun, to another, the glory of the moon, to another, the glory of the stars. On and on we could go there. Being a saved believer, the where question having been settled, the quality of your eternal experience is enhanced and amplified by doing the things God gives you the strength and grace to do. Oh, the kindness of God. It is extraordinary. Romans 2, 4. It is the kindness of God that ought to lead us to repentance. So how do we draw near and hold fast and encourage one another? Well, we look back and then we look forward and now we turn to the present based on that, and respond. Finally this morning, verse 38. Still in Habakkuk, chapter 2, um, quoted out of the Septuagint. I think this is verse 4. But my righteous one shall live by faith. You might have the just shall live by faith. This is powerful here. And if he shrinks back, God says, my soul has no pleasure in him. But... We are not of those who shrink back to destruction. That's not who we are. But of those who have faith to the persevering of the soul. All right. And so the righteous shall live by faith. Very popular verse. This is quoted from, again, Habakkuk 2.4 in the Septuagint. It's, quote, it's quoted in, in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and here in Hebrews chapter 10. Interestingly, Romans focuses upon the righteous. Uh, Galatians focuses upon the live peace. And in Hebrews, our writer focuses upon the faith. And this is going to set us up marvelously now as we head into chapter 11, which many of you know is the chapter in the Bible that is called the Hall of Faith, right? 
And what he is going to begin demonstrating to this church in chapter 11 is that this walk of faith that he's been calling them to here, this has indeed been their national history. That God has always called men and women to walk before him by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, right? God has always called men and women to walk before him by faith. And so we're going to survey all of the heroes of the faith, their extraordinary chapter uh, on deck here at VXB. Now notice what he says there. That God has no pleasure in those that shrink back in the faith, those that live not by faith. And so here's what the writer is saying in the immediate context here. Conflicts reproaches, tribulations, they are going to come your way. They are instrument, they are, they are there as God's instruments to shape us and mature us and refine us as he is performing the separating work. He is forever weaning our hearts and our appetites off of the temporary and inferior things because he has so much better for us. He has the superior, he has the eternal, and he is heaven bent on leading you and I to joy and marvel and wonder and awe. And so when the trial knocks on your front door, and it will, there are two ways that you can respond. Number one, you can believe what God says in his word. You can take the cross to the crown. You can know that God is working. All things work to the good of those who are called according to his purposes. That's Romans eight twenty eight. You know that verse well here. You, you can simply take God at his word. One of two things are going to happen. You can simply take God at his word. That, that's your first option. Or you can get mad at God and you can point your finger at God and you can blame God. You can run from God. You can retreat from God. God takes no pleasure in this. Why? Because when you run from the very tribulation that God has purposed for your good. You are short-circuiting the work he is trying to do in your life and, and you will be the poorer for it. Do you understand? When you reject the very work that is coming to bring you to glory, you're short-circuiting the work that God is trying to do. The Lord takes no pleasure when you do that because he loves you and he's after the welfare of your soul eternally. Now, I find this very interesting. It's just interesting to me that God enjoys being believed. Here's a sneak preview from chapter 11. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him, right? Right? The only way that you can please God is to believe that what he has said is true. I find that very interesting. God wants you to live like the Bible is true. How about that? God wants you and I to live like the gospel is true. And we've got a category for this, don't we? Sure we do. Let's land the plane here. Now, as parents, as parents, is that not what brings you pleasure as well? I, look, you got a couple of kids. Now, the one kid, he believes that everything that you say is true, all right? The stove is hot. Don't touch that stove. You're going to burn yourself. This kid says to himself, you know what? Mom loves me, all right? You know, mom has never lied to me. I trust her I don't think I'm going to mess with that stove. And you're just so pleased with that child. Wow, they believe me. This is awesome. Well, then you got the other kid. <laughs> hey, don't touch that stove. The stove is hot. And, well, they are just bound and determined to learn the hard way, aren't they? Ah, she never wants me to have any fun. And I, I'm just, I'm not so sure she knows what she's talking about. Ah! 
I told you that was going to... Now, of course you love both of those children the same, right? But which of those two children are you going to find more pleasing as a parent? Well, it is going to be the child that trusts your counsel, that listens to your directions. And friends, God is the very same way. Look, God is in love with you. God is never going to lie to you. And if you will run his program for your life, you are going to discover greater and greater degrees of joy as you allow him to wean you from the inferior affections that do not last. Now, maybe that stings a little. Right? In fact, oftentimes it, it stings more than a little, right? And, and how it stings is usually a function of how tight a grip we have upon the inferior affections. Listen to me. Let, let me love you well here. This is good for you, all right? The tighter and more stubbornly we hold on to these idols of ours, the more our being separated from them is going to sting. We should count on that. And I pray that it makes sense to you. It should make sense to you. Every good and loving parent knows this in lesser measure. But he is the perfect parent. He must do for you and me what we are unwilling to do for ourselves because he loves you and is heaven bent on securing for you the greatest eternal experience imaginable. Why? Well, because it's forever. All right? Look, what he has for you is better. Whatever has just consumed your heart, whatever has an iron-fisted grip upon your heart today, I am telling you, the word of God is telling you what he has for you is better. And what he has for you is eternal. Perfect love and infinite knowledge will always demand that which is best for your welfare. And his love is perfect, and his knowledge is infinite. Now, each and every one of this, each and every one of us in this room, at one point or another, you're going to have to cry uncle on the sovereignty of God. I've told you that before. You're, you're going to have to simply take God at his word. God is not against you. God is not your enemy. He loves you unspeakably and perfectly. And he has shown you that definitively and spectacularly on that cross. He could not have possibly demonstrated his love for you in a greater way. He who was infinite and perfect came and took upon himself all of your imperfections so he could make you perfect too. Now, if you want to please God, you are going to have to believe that, period. And so what you and I need now is we need endurance. And endurance is what you need. You need to get your second win here. Now, now I started this deal following Christ. And I'm going to finish this deal following. Yes, I was one of those kids that had to learn the hard way. That describes everybody in this room. So again, brothers and sisters, the fight that you and I are in, it's not the culture war. It's not the political war. Look, God is sovereign over all of that. And he is working behind the, scene, the scenes because that's what he says in his word. The election is important. Who, f who fills the position of the Supreme Court? That is important. But you can rest your head on the, your pillow at night because God is on the throne. Okay, the fight that you and I are in is the fight to delight in Jesus Christ for the glory of his great name. And the way that you win that fight is to simply believe God. That's how. Every one of us in this room, again, sooner or later, you're going to have to cry uncle on the sovereignty of God and believe what he has told you in his word. Sooner would be better. I wish somebody would have gave me this sermon 20 years ago. But here now is the remarkable, ravishing reality that is yours when you do. You ready? Here it is. 
You cannot lose. Like, do you understand that? Like, you cannot lose. There are only three possibilities for the Christian soul. Number one, you can be blessed. And of course, that's good. Number two, you can die. And that takes you straight into the presence of Jesus face to face. Oh, imagine the glory of that. And then number three, you can suffer and the Lord will make you more like Jesus. And that too is very good. He will usher your soul onto greater and greater levels of joy and he will not stop until he's done. You will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you understand? You cannot lose in Christ. You can't lose. There is nothing to fear. There is nothing that will stop your coming into infinite glory and mind-blowing, brain-bending, rapturous joy. Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For yet in a very little while, a very little while, he who is coming will come and not delay. I don't know about you, but my garden could stand a little tending this week. I've got some landscaping to do. You probably do too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that time and time again when we go to your word, we are lifted up. We are encouraged. The rewards that are promised us are staggering. God, I pray you would help us to, to see and, and appropriate that extraordinary reality. We don't do that so well for the simple reason that we're still so attached to the inferior and temporary. God, free us from this, this bondage. Bring us into an understanding of what you are doing, why you are doing it. Help us to trust you even in the trial because you are good. In short, God, would you help us to believe your word? And the scripture comes to my mind in Mark 9, 24. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I, I believe that you are the son of God that has died for my sin. But help my unbelief in walking that out. That is our cry today, Lord. We believe, help our unbelief. Lead us to, to this extraordinary joy, we pray in Jesus' name. People of God said, amen. Let's worship.